لمحمد خير الشبائل وكامل وهي الدلاء بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على السيد المرسلين حبيبنا الشفينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وبعض Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome once more to, oh, welcome once more back to our Sira class after a, a short break, just about a month. The last thing we had stopped by in speaking on the Sira was this incident, which uh, Suraka he started to pursue the Prophet ﷺ whilst he was on the Hijrah. And on three separate occasions, the horse of Suraka threw him off. And these people were so suspicious that whenever something like that happened, they thought it was a bad omen. And when he caught up with the Prophet ﷺ, his horse began to sink into the sand. And he sought peace from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, Oh Muhammad, grant me peace. Because, I mean, he was in pursuit of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because uh, he had in mind the 100 red camels that was at stake. I mean, you bring back Muhammad dead or alive and you will get 100 red camels. And that, that was the price. And that was his main concern. But now the one who was pursuing Muhammad is now begging for his life. He said, oh Muhammad, please grant me peace. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, I grant you peace. So Suraka, he told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, listen, I don't just want you to say it, write it on a piece of paper for me, or a piece of cloth. Write it on, on some, some, make a document. And I mean, that document, it saved his life. When Taif was conquered, and they held Suraka, and they was, they was going to execute him, he pulled out a piece of paper. And that is the document that saved his life. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Bakr Siddiq Radiallahu Ta'ala, whilst they were on the Hijrah, they came upon a tent and in front of that tent was an old woman sitting. The old woman, his name, her name was Ummu Ma'bad. Now, Ummu Ma'bad, she was a very generous woman. Whenever ten uh, caravans will pass, or a rider will pass, she used to always offer them something to eat or something to drink, as the case might be. So the Prophet Sallallahu and Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala, they came to this tent where Umm Ma'abad, she was sitting in front of the tent and they asked her if she had anything to spare. I mean, traveling for so long and that distance, your, your provision is going to run, it's going to run out. So she, he asked them, do you have anything to spare? And she said in response, if I had anything, then you wouldn't have to ask. If I had anything, you wouldn't have to ask. So the Prophet ﷺ, he saw in the corner of her tent a goat, a lean goat. And he asked her, what's the problem with this goat? And she said that this goat is too weak to go out with the other animals to feed. Because it's, I mean, it's, it's lean, it's weak, it, it can't even walk properly, far us to reach the grazing field. So the Prophet Sallallahu he asked her, is there any milk in her? And she responded by saying, she is weaker than that. I mean, she don't even have milk in her. She's so weak. So the Prophet Sallallahu he said, would you allow me to milk her? And she said, well, okay, no problem, go ahead. So the Prophet ﷺ, he goes to milk this goat and he asks for a big container. I mean, he didn't ask for a small container. He asked for a big container. 
And then he touched the goat and he began milking. Milk was flowing so much out of this animal that froth started to accumulate on the top. And that's the pressure that the milk was coming. I mean, the froth started to, to accumulate on the top of the, the vessel. And he milked the animal until this large container was filled. And he gives it to Umm Muhammad to drink first. And she drinks. Then he gave it to Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala, and then to Abdullah bin Uraiqat, then to Amr. And they all drank, and he was the last to drink. And then he says, the servant of the people is the last to drink. Now this is a general principle. The servant of the people is the last to eat. I mean, you have a program home by your house, you invite a few people, and you are the first person to sit and eat, and you have your guests serving you. That's unethical. It's unprincipled. The guests expect to be served by you. So it's a general principle in Islam. That the servant of the people, he eats last. The servant of the people, he drinks last. So he says to them after, he said the servant of the people is the last to drink. So he was the last to drink and then he left and there was still a lot of milk remaining in the container. So the husband of Umm Ma'bad, he comes back with the flock of animals and he sees this container with milk in it. I mean he left knowing that there wasn't anything in the house. He comes back into the tent and he sees this container with milk. And he says, oh Umm Ma'bad, I mean where did this milk come from? Where the milk came from? And she said, I mean, listen to her response. A blessed man visited us. And this is one of the miracles of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A blessed man visited us and he's the one who milked the she-goat. So Abu Ma'bad, her husband, he asked her to describe this man to him. Now, Umar Ma'abad, she gave a description of the Prophet wasallam in such a way that until this day, it remains the best description that ever described Muhammad wasallam. I mean, look at uh, um, Amr ibn al-As. Amr ibn al-As, he said that there was a stage in his life when Muhammad was the worst person on the face of the earth. And he said, if I were to get my hands on him, I would have killed him. And this is, Amr, Amr ibn al-As was the same one who went to Abyssinia to negotiate when the Muslims migrated on the, first, uh, the second migration to negotiate with the Najashi to send them back. So he was a negotiator. And he was also one of those people who used to plot against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Muslims. So he said that at that stage in his life, if I were to get my hands on Muhammad, then I will kill him. He said, but if I had died in that stage, I would have surely been thrown in Jahannam. He said, but then Allah changed my heart and Iman entered my heart. And love for the Prophet Sallallahu entered my heart until he became the most beloved person to me living on the face of the earth. And he was saying to his son, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala, and he said, oh my son, if you were to ask me to describe Muhammad to you, I would not be able to do so. He said, whenever Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to come before me or speak to me, I had so much respect for him. I had so much love for him that I could not have afford to look him straight in the face. I used to always look down and humble myself before him. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is a man who lived with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Umm Ma'abad is someone who had a brief moment with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the description she gave about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
remains until this day the best description of the Prophet I mean even though she met the Messenger of Allah once and it was in the night I mean they didn't have floodlights and spotlights at that time to you know well he's in the spotlight so you know she could have seen in details so Abu Ma'bad he asked her to describe this man she said I saw him to be a man of evident splendor fine in figure his face was handsome slim in form his head not too small elegant and good-looking his eyes were large and black his eyelids were long his voice deep was a very intelligent person his brows were high his hair in plaits now when they say that their hair was in plait it does not mean to say that they took and they plaited like how females plait their hair a sort of braid you know it was just in a swoop coming down probably it wasn't plait from the beginning here because people take this thing and you know take it to the travel and say well that's a plait so they start plaiting the hair from the front here and you know you don't want to get that from and they say well and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a plait is here. Uh, no it's not like that. His hair was probably in a rose and it looked like a plait. Besides his head was covered. His head used to be covered. He used to wear an imama. So she said that his hair was in plaits and his neck was long. His beard was thick and he gave an impression of dignity when silent and of high intelligence when he spoke his words were very impressive and he was decisive in his speech not trivial his ideas were like poles moving on their string he seemed the most splendid and fine looking man from a distance and the very best of all from close by, medium in height. You will find him not too tall, nor too short. A tree branch, as it were, between two others, but he was the finest looking of the tree. The best in proportion. He was the center of his companion's attention. When he spoke, they listened well. And he, he ordered, they hurried to obey. A man well helped, well served, never refuted. And that's the description she gave. Abu Ma'abad, her husband, said, This man, I mean, he has to be Muhammad. He has to be Muhammad, the one whom the Quraysh they are pursuing. Abu Ma'abad, he says, if I meet this man, Muhammad, I will pledge allegiance to him and become Muslim. I will become Muslim. By the way, uh, Umm Ma'abad, she had pledged allegiance to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she became Muslim. And this is, I mean, anyone who had this type of uh, meeting with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, especially if he had done something like that, I mean, they couldn't help it but believe. Today, people will go to some magic show, the man pulling a rabbit out of a hat and believe that this man could really pull a live rabbit out of a hat that you mean that that's on his head, or pull a, 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 a bunch of cloth out of his mouth, or you know, all these, these, and people believe in that. People believe in that. But to see a man milk an animal, and the animal, I mean, the owner of the animal is saying that this animal don't have any milk. I mean, look at the thing. The poor thing, it's too weak to go out and graze. It's too weak. How can you get milk from this? So it was one of the miracles of the Prophet ﷺ. Before we continue, there are a few things that we need to learn about the, the hijra. The, this concept of a hijrah, there are two types of hijrah. One, there is the figurative meaning of the word hijrah, 
and then there is the literal meaning of the, the word hijrah. The figurative hijrah is, as was mentioned in the riwayat, as mentioned in the Sunan of Imam Nasai, the Prophet وسلم, he says that hijrah is to leave what Allah dislikes. Because the word hijrah, it means a migration. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, he says, hijrah is to leave what Allah dislikes, and this is the figurative meaning of the word hijrah. It is to migrate from a state of sin to a state of obedience to Allah. This is like what Allah Rabbil Asa, he says in Quran, and stay away from impurities. And sins is, uh, is impurities. So technically Allah is saying stay away from sins. Because it would not make your body impure or your clothing impure, it causes your soul to become impure. It causes one's soul to become impure. So the hijrah, it is a migration from that which is impure to that which is pure. It's a migration, the figurative meaning. It is to migrate from committing wrong acts towards obedience of Allah. And this type of hijrah, it's mandatory on every Muslim. It's mandatory on every Muslim that he leaves a state of sin and he migrates to a state of obedience. And then you have the literal hijrah, which is it's more to move from one land to another land. And you see a lot of people migrating today. And uh, whenever you ask people, well, why are you migrating? I mean, how many people say that they are migrating because, you know, um, I cannot worship Islam, I cannot worship Allah in peace in Trinidad? I mean, who can make a statement like that? Who can make a statement like that? The person who makes a statement like that haven't traveled much. And when I say travel much, I mean out of the country. He haven't traveled to Europe or haven't traveled to any other part of the world. He probably traveled from here to Toko or here to Cedrus or San Fernando or something like that. Probably had one or two bad experiences with Muslims. He went to the masjid and someone stole his slippers. Or, you know, somebody stepped on his shoes and dirtied his shoes. Or someone parked in front of him and, and blocked him because he was in a hurry. Or, uh, that, and that's a bad experience he had. I mean, sometimes you go for Hajj and you lose your, your footwear. Sometimes you go for Hajj and someone pulls a stone and it goes in the wrong direction. And you get that, well, all that's in a jihad. That's a sacrifice. You know what I mean? Something small. It's something small. But nobody says that I'm going to uh, America or England or Europe because it's difficult for me to practice Islam in Trinidad. And Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala, he left Makkah. And he met Ibn al on the outskirts of Makkah. Ibn al he asked him, Oh, Abu Bakr, where are you going? I mean, Abu Bakr was a tradesman. But he didn't say, well, I'm going to Syria because the trade there is better. This Quraysh are giving me a hard time in my trade. He didn't say that. He said, I'm going to a land where I can worship my Lord in peace. I'm going to a land where I can worship my Lord in peace. So the literal hijrah is to move from one land to another. You move from a land of evil to a land of good. I mean, you do not move from a land which your Islam is good. And then you go to a country where your Islam is a little insecure. You cannot pray in peace. You're always looked at or something. And then you say, boy, I have to do this because you can't, you know, go to the masjid in peace and I have to stay home and people start you know, looking for an excuse. But why, why did you really migrate? I'm migrating because things are a little tough in Trinidad. Anyway, you go in the world, things are tough. Anyway, you go in the world. So we come back to the narration of the Prophet Sallallahu The very first hadith that Imam Bukhari mentions in his Sahih, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِإِمْرِ مَا 
Your actions are judged by your intention. If you migrated to seek wealth, and that's your intention for migrating, then that's what you're going to get. For a man, is that what he intends? If you migrate for Allah and His deen, then that is what you're going to get, and Allah will give you everything. But how many people today here saying, I'm migrating only for the sake of Allah and His Rasul? How many people uh, say that? I'm going to America and migrating for Allah and His Rasul. And you are leaving a country where you can practice your deen in peace, and you're going into a country where it's a little more difficult. And this, you know, it's like an incident that occurred in the time of the Bani Israel, <coughs> that a man from the Bani Israel who had killed 100 people, we probably know of this incident. And then he went and he consulted a scholar. So the scholar, he said to him, Allah will accept your tawbah. Allah will accept your tawbah, but you have to move from this town. You have to move from this town because it's a town of evil. And the more you stay in the town, the more evil you will commit. And go, so go to that other town because therein you will find people who will support you worshiping Allah. Probably you want to come out of this act of disobedience. So why don't you go to the other town? So that you, you know, the people there will support you. You're living amongst a bunch of evil people. You expect them to support you in goodness? Another benefit of the hijrah is that we can notice from the hijrah of the Prophet wasallam the elaborate planning that went into the hijrah itself. The Prophet is, for example, the Prophet wasallam he visits Abu Bakr as-Siddiq at noon. Now, noon time, Noontime, people in Mecca, they normally are resting. I mean, the sun is too hot for trade. And the sun was really hot this year. And Hajj is going more into summer and it's going to get, I mean, it's going to get hot, really hot. And summertime, you know, people just pray their salah and probably just go back in their rooms and, and take a rest or something like that. So the people used to normally take a rest at noontime. So people would not be venturing outside uh, in the, the heat of the sun, the midday sun. So the Prophet ﷺ, he was out at that time when no one can notice him. And in case someone does see him, they may not be able to recognize him because he, his face was covered. Secondly, the Prophet ﷺ, he came to the house of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and he asked Abu Bakr to clear the house because the Prophet ﷺ, he wanted to keep this a secret. Thirdly, he had Ali ibn Abi Talib and sleep on his bed. Fourth, the camels were already ready and prepared. When he mentioned it to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, Abu Bakr said, O Messenger of Allah, I already have two camels ready. I bought two camels and read them especially for this moment. Fifth, they left under the cover of the darkness from the back door. Sixth, they hired a guide. Seven, Medina is north of Mecca, whilst the Prophet and Abu Bakr as Sadiq they headed south in order to throw off the unbelievers. The normal route is to go north. So they went south along the coastline. Number eight, they went into hiding for three days in the cave. Number nine, Abdullah ibn Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he would come to them with information that he would gather in Mecca during the day, and in the night he will come and tell them what's going on in Mecca. So he had information always coming in. Number ten, Amir bin Fuhaira, he brings food, he used to bring food for them. So I mean, you could see the planning a lot of planning went into the migration of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And my dear respected Muslims, this is how we need to conduct our affairs. We shouldn't just say, well, okay, mashallah, you know, no problem. Allah will take care of everything and, you know, Allah will give us barakah and, 
you know, just do what you have to do, you know what I mean? You know, I really wish that some people will do what they have to do. I really wish that people can do what they have to do as Muslims. Or what they are supposed to do. Sometimes, it doesn't mean to say that you have to do a whole lot. You just have to do what you have to do, but do the best you can do. Allah knows your limit. Allah knows your ability. Just do your best. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I mean, sometimes people say, well, don't worry, Allah will take care of that, Allah will take care of that. I mean, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he went into extreme planning for the Hijrah. He could have said, well, Allah will take care of that. The planning was physical. I mean, Allah is the best of planners. When Allah had already promised him protection, I mean, he is the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is the messenger of Allah. Allah will take care of him and Allah will support him, Allah will honor him. <coughs> and he has all the support. And he didn't have to do all that. But still, he went into all this planning because it's a lesson for us. That in our Islamic works, we need to plan properly. Yes, everything is in the hands of Allah. You know, when it comes to our personal self, we, we put things in proper place. Isn't that so? When it comes to Islam, well, anything can go. Anything can go. When it comes to our personal self, we are ready to give in and say, well, yeah, yeah, you know, let's try that. When it comes to the house of Allah and to Islam, you always find bickering, constant bickering, argument and everything. I mean, over the masjid, over the imam, over the running of the masjid. I mean, why do we have to have so much, you know, kuchur when it comes to running the affairs of the house of Allah? It's amazing, isn't that so? So shaitan is working overtime. And we are not planning our business properly. So he's always a step ahead of us. The Prophet ﷺ is teaching us very importantly. Because the hijrah was an important thing in Islam. To move the Islamic empire from Makkah and carry it to Medina. Where Islam could have grown and they could have built their religion strong. That was needed. But still the messenger of Allah, even though he was under the protection of Allah, and even though the help of Allah was assured, he went into so much planning. And that's a great lesson for us. In everything that we do, we need to plan properly. Not only when it comes to the affairs of our house, our family business, our personal business, when it also comes to the affairs of the masjid. When it comes to the affairs of Islam and running the affairs of the masjid. Another very important thing that we learn from the hijrah is the role of women. Now sometimes our sisters, they feel that, you know, well, there isn't much. You know, everything is from the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam and from the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. There were many great women in Islam. Many, many great Women who were scholars in Islam. Women who were versed in tafsir. Women who were versed in jurisprudential issues. Women who were from amongst the muhaddithin. And this is something we learn from the hijrah. The role of women, and our sisters need to see, the, see their, who their role models are. I mean, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa is our role models. But for a woman, how did we come to know of the, the hijrah? How did we come to know about the migration of the Prophet ﷺ? Who narrated the, the entire incident of the hijrah? I mean, when it is in Sahih al-Bukhari or Sahih Muslim, who it was? It was Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And there are so much narrations speaking about the inside life, the things which we need to know 
about our personal life that is narrated by no other than Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. So she played a very vital role in Islam. So it was Aisha radiallahu ta'ala who narrated the entire story, the entire incident of the Hijrite was preserved by Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. A look at Asma bin Abi Bakr radiallahu ta'ala and her sister. She tore her griddle and put food in it to send it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and her father, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala. And also she suffered because of the hijrah. I mean Abu Jahal and some of the men of the Quraysh, <clears throat> one day they came knocking on the door of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala and after the Messenger of Allah and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, they had left. And uh, Asma bin Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala, she opened the door. So Abu Jahal, he said, where is your father? And she said, well, you know, I, I don't know. He slapped Asma so hard that her earrings fell off. So hard that her earrings fell off. And she took that suffering only for the sake of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and her father to protect them. I mean, she didn't go running around screaming, oh, yeah, 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 you know, um, yeah, they, they, they left, he left with uh, the messenger of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa on the hijrah. <coughs> she didn't do that. <coughs> she took that. And she suffered the consequences. She said, I, I don't know where my father is. I mean, some of us leave the home and we don't even tell people where we are going. So if someone comes and says, where your father is? So, well, I don't know. Imagine you collecting a slap for Asma. She, is, she took that suffering only for the sake of protecting the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, you know, there was another incident that when, uh, I mean, she was a very, Asma radiallahu ta'ala was a very creative person. Whilst they was in the home, the father of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala became blind. And you know, he came and whilst Abu Bakr uh, Abu Jahl was in front, he started to make some noise. And you know, he was saying, oh, you know, you are suffering. Look at how you are suffering. Abu Bakr, he didn't leave any money in the house. But she was a very creative person. She took some small stone and she put it into a bag and she shook it and put it in his hand and said, no, 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 you know, he, uh, he left some money, you know, he left some money in the house. And he said, okay, you know, well, that was really good of him to leave some money in the house. She's a very creative person. Another very important lesson that we learn from the Hijrah is that as Muslims, we need to choose our companions wisely. We need to choose our companions wisely. Who did the Prophet Sallallahu choose as his companion on the Hijrah? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. It was Abu Bakr and it was the best choice the Prophet Sallallahu made. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala, first of all, he loved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa beyond. I mean, the love he had for Muhammad. When uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, went to Jerusalem and to the heavens and he came back, some of the munafiqeen, they met Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and in a very sarcastic manner, they were saying to him, did you hear what Muhammad say? He said he went to Jerusalem and back in one night. I mean, and he didn't only say that, he said he went to the heavens. Too. I mean, what was Abu Bakr's response? Did he say, oh yeah, did he really say that? You know, I need to go and find out. He wasn't thinking about the route. Well, it will take about two weeks to reach to Jerusalem and to the heavens. I mean, I, I don't know how long it's going to take you to reach there. He wasn't thinking like that. He said, he responded by saying, if Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that, then that's the truth. If Muhammad said that, then it has to be the truth. He did not make an excuse for Muhammad and say, well, you know, he's probably a little tired, you know, and, and sleepy and probably he's saying these things, you know, just to, you know, probably, you know, had some bad experience and, you know. 
He wasn't making an excuse. He said, if Muhammad said that, then it has to be the truth. So what better person to choose as his companion? I mean, and this love that he had for the Prophet wasallam, it wasn't lip service love. It wasn't lip service love. Today, many Muslims will say, you know, oh yeah, yeah, you know, we love Allah and we, uh, you know, we love the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and it's mere words we are, we are parroting off. But then you look at their, their actions, and it tells a different story. It tells a total different story. Yes, you love Allah. Yes, you love the Rasul, but you are oppressing people. You're taking advantage of your own Muslim brother and sister. Whilst this bond is supposed to be sacred, you are constantly destroying that bond of brotherhood and love and unity which you are supposed to have between yourself. And then you say, oh yeah, yeah, no, we are brothers, we are Muslims and we need to you know, put our heads together and we need to for the, the benefit of Islam, but you are going contrary. And you are abusive to people and you are always treating people in a very harsh way and speaking badly to people and saying things to throw at people and throwing things at people g uh, gap and, and how, how can we live as Muslims when we people do things like that and then we are saying oh yeah you know the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa yeah we love that guy and you know um, yeah Allah and his Rasul and and then your action is contradictory I mean how can you love your Muslim brothers and how can we treat them as a companion when we break every rule in the book when it comes to Muslims? Sometimes we treat the unbelievers better than we treat our own Muslim brothers and our sisters. I mean, we're supposed to treat them with such love and dignity and honor. And we treat the unbelievers better than we treat our own Muslim brothers and sisters. It's very sad. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala, when he found out that he was going to be, uh, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed him that, oh, uh, Abu Bakr, you will be my companion, he cried. I mean, he wasn't crying because of the journey, it's so long and tedious. He was crying out of joy. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala, and she said, I never saw a big man cry like that. I never saw it. I mean, he used his entire family to serve the Prophet ﷺ on his journey. Uh, he had a very high sense of security. I mean, whilst he was walking with the Prophet ﷺ, he wasn't only walking and talking, but he was, he was always looking around. You know, looking, probably there was some, something that will jump out from behind some rock and attack them. So he was always vigil and he was always on that alertness. That, you know, probably there was someone who was following them. Probably there was something, you know, or someone is sat in a trap. So he was always, either he was in front or the back or on either side. You know, and, and when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Abu Bakr, why are, you always, why are you always running in front and the back and on both sides? I, I see you running around. What's the matter? He said, oh, Prophet of Allah, whilst I'm walking in front of you, the thought of someone attacking you from behind comes to my mind. So I rush to the back. And whilst I'm at the back of you, I feel that someone may jump out in front from behind some rock and attack you. So I immediately rush to the front. Some of us, whilst we are walking, we are always tired and thirsty and say, you know, let's take a break. You know, and we're talking and unconcerned about what's going on around us. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he had a very high sense of alertness when it comes to security, especially around the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He loved him immensely. And protecting him was an honor. I mean, can you imagine the type of conversation they probably had on that journey? Can you imagine that? Being alone. With the Prophet wasallam on that journey, can you imagine what they spoke about? It's a journey. A really, really journey. It's a journey of a lifetime. Being alone. So he had a very high sense of security and he was very wise and he was willing to sacrifice his life. He was willing to sacrifice his life for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala became the Khalifa, Amir al-Mu'minin, uh, he heard that some people they were gathering 
and they were discussing, they had gathered and they were discussing who is better. Was it Abu Bakr al-Siddiq or was it Umar radiallahu ta'ala? I mean, if you study the life of Umar ibn Khattab, this, this, he was amazing. Umar ibn Khattab amazes people, his life, his conquests, his conquests, the things that he did, his personality amazes people. His uh, steadfastness, his strength, his ability to rule is an amazing, it's an amazing thing. So he heard some people, they had gathered to discuss, you know, who do you think is better between Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhum, who was better? So Umar radiallahu ta'ala, immediately he rushed towards them and he said, one day in the life of Abu Bakr is better than the entire family of Umar. Now listen carefully. He said, one day in the life of Abu Bakr, it is better than the entire family of Umar. And then he narrated to them this incident. He said, that day in the life of Abu Bakr was the day that he went on the hijrah with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Whilst he was always in front and in the back and always in the front and always in the back. He said that day is better than Umar and his entire family. I mean that single day. One single day. He said it's better than not only Umar but the entire life of Umar and not only his life but the entire family of Umar radiallahu ta'ala and that shows it shows us the recognition the sahabas they had for one another and also it shows us the recognition the sahabas had for Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala and today you don't see that between Muslims between Muslims you don't see that it's always a, a myself thing what I have done and you know, yeah, you know, I have done that, and you know, and we have done that, but really it's, it's, you're speaking about yourself. And we are like this, and we are not like that, and we are people who do this, but you are really speaking about yourself. But you do not stop for one moment to recognize the good works other people are doing. That is a disease in people's heart. It's a disease in people's heart when they cannot stop for one moment to see the amount of goodness other people are doing, whether you are a scholar or you are a non-scholar in Islam. I mean, everyone is doing something for the upliftment of Allah's deen. But it breaks a person's morale when he's always looked down upon. It breaks him. No matter how much he does and how much he's doing, no recognition. I mean, people don't do things for recognition. But when you're always thinking about yourself, and yeah, yeah, you know, I, I did this, and I can do that, and we, and the we statement is used, but it refers to yourself. That's a very poor quality in people. This wasn't existing amongst the Sahabas. They always recognize, especially Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, radiallahu ta'ala, especially Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. I mean, they could not outweigh him in doing good deeds. And I mean, I'm sure you can recollect that narration, you know, when the Prophet ﷺ was asking them, which of you is the first to give sadaqah, and which of you is the first? And he was constantly raising his hands. While Abu Bakr, uh, Umar ibn Khattab was only saying, no, Messenger of Allah, we just began our day. We just started our day. And he was just raising his hand and said, well, you know, Abdurrahman ibn Awf, he became ill, and I heard that, so I went to visit him first thing this morning, and, and all these things. And he was, but he used to do these things not planned <laughs> he didn't plan to do good he didn't fix the time well from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock i'm going to do good deeds and after that well you know anything can go whenever a moment arises to do something good he sees the opportunity and this is what we need to do as muslims whenever an opportunity presents itself to do something commendable to do a good deed and it can be anything. That can be anything. 
whether it's helping someone cross the road, or a person comes up, uh, comes up to you and asks you to help them, or someone, you know, his car breaks down on the side of the road, uh, or something or the other. It may not be, it may not always be money. Because some, our, our perception is that whenever someone asks us, we think that they want money. Probably the person wants something to eat. You have some extra food in your home, you give it to the beggars. These small acts of goodness and kindness, it goes a long way. It goes a long way. We think that goodness is only towards the masjid, towards the people, the general people on the outside also, towards the animals. I mean, look at the woman from the Bani Israel, a prostitute, who took out her shoes, went down in the well, scooped up some water, and then held her shoes in her mouth and climbed back up the well and gave the dog the water to drink. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah forgive that woman. He forgave that woman of, uh, of her uh, bad deeds. It does not have to be something big because sometimes we look to score with something big. It can be a very small act that you do and because of the sincerity of doing that small deed, Allah loves it so much that He elevates your status so high in His sight. And you, whilst you are doing it, you don't think much about it. Oh, well, you know, I'm just doing this. But the sincerity of doing it, it's, it's so much, it is so high. And a very important, next very important thing that we need to learn from the Hijrah is that a lot of what the Prophet ﷺ was doing at this stage, it was done in secret. Not much people knew about it. And he was doing it in secret in order to preserve Islam. In order to preserve the Muslims. I mean, whilst the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala they were traveling in the desert, they met some people. And Anas bin Malik radiallahu ta'ala, and he says, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, he was a, a person who was well known. He was well known amongst the people. Whilst the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was not known to the people on the outside. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala, he was a tradesman, so people knew him. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he wasn't traveling all over, you know, and going here and going there. But the people in Makkah knew him, but the people on the outskirts, the Bedouin, did not know him. So whilst they were traveling, they came upon this, you know, these people. And the people, they knew Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, but they did not know who the other person was. So they ask Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an, who is this person with you? Who is this person? Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an, he said that this man is a guide. He is showing me the path. Now, what these people are thinking but what they understand by that is that, oh yeah, yeah, he's a guide showing Abu Bakr truly, you know, this, this desert. You know, and, and that, that's what they were probably thinking. But what Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala meant was that this man, he's guiding me towards Allah. He said, this man is a guide and he is showing me the path. And that's it. So they thought, well, this is Abu Bakr's guide through the desert and he knows the routes, you know, to all his different places. So he's showing Abu Bakr around. What Abu Bakr today was saying is that he's guiding me to Allah. This man is guiding me towards Allah. So he put it in this statement in order to protect the identity of Muhammad because a, a ransom is on his head. They had uh, Abu Jahl, he had put 100 camels Red camels, whether dead or alive, you know, if you bring in Muhammad dead or alive, then you will get a hundred red camels. And that's the price on his head. So he did not tell them who Muhammad was, because now you have, everyone is looking for Muhammad, and this price is on the head of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he did that in order to protect the identity of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. <clears throat> so he really wasn't lying. He wasn't lying, he was speaking the truth. Is how the people understood it. Next, the Prophet ﷺ, they met a person by the name of Buraid al-Aslami. 
and he, tell, he did tell him that this man is Muhammad, he was alone, and he gave him the Messenger of Allah, gave him Dawah, and Burayd al Aslami, he became Muslim. He became Muslim, and he joined the Prophet وسلم, in 16 out of the 19 battles that the Prophet وسلم, participated in. Burayd al Aslami participated, and he was the head of his people. The Prophet وسلم, on his journey, he also met two thieves. And he gave them, he gave them dawah and they became Muslim. The Prophet وسلم, he asked them, he said, what's your name? And they said, our name is Al-Muhannan. Now, Al-Muhannan means the dishonored ones. The dishonored ones. So the people used to call them this name because of what they was involved with. So the Prophet وسلم, he said, now you are no longer dishonored. You are Muslim. <coughs> the Prophet وسلم, he met a shepherd and the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he said to the person, he said, can you please give us some milk to drink? The shepherd, he said, none of the animals have milk at the moment. So the Prophet وسلم, he he chose one out of them and he said, will you allow me to milk this animal? So the man said, well, okay, no problem, go ahead. The Prophet وسلم, he milked it and a lot of milk uh, started to flow out of the animal. A lot of milk came out and he gave the shepherd to drink first and then he drank Abu Bakr as siddiq radiallahu ta'ala and drank. And the shepherd, he asked the Prophet وسلم, he said, for heaven's sake, man, who are you? Who are you? The Prophet وسلم, he responded by saying, do you think you can keep a secret if I told you? And the man said, yes. So the Prophet وسلم, he said, I am Muhammad, the messenger of Allah. The shepherd said, you mean the one whom the Quraysh is calling a Sabian? See, whenever you become a Muslim, <clears throat> they never used to call you Muslim because they know the word Muslim carries a good meaning. A Muslim is one who submits himself to the commands of Allah, to the will of Allah. He's a Muslim. So they used to call him a Sabian. And the Sabian, it was a degrading term. The Quraysh used to call him, and they used to level against him in a very uh, degrading manner, accusing them. So they used to call them Sabians rather than call them Muslims. And this is when Abu Bakr, when Umar radiallahu ta'ala, he uh, became Muslim and he asked for the person, he said, get the person whose mouth does not hold water. So they called this guy and he said to him quietly, he said, Umar became Muslim. He said, go tell the people in Makkah. And the man was running down the street and he wasn't saying, Oh, people of Quraysh, oh, people of Quraysh, Ammar became Muslim. He was saying, oh, people of Quraysh, Ammar became uh, Sabah. And Omar was running quickly behind him saying, no, no, Muslim, Muslim, not uh, Sabah, not Sabah, not a Sabian, a Muslim, a Muslim. So they used to call him by this degrading term. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, yes, I am the person whom the Quraysh, they seek. So the man said, well, I bear witness that you bring the truth. I mean, you see a man milk an animal in front of your eyes, and the animal is weak, it, it doesn't have any milk, and you yourself are saying that, well, the animals don't have any milk, and very, before your very eye, you see a man just touch an animal, and you get a whole container of milk. That's a miracle. Something worth thinking about. So he said, I bear witness, witness that you bring the truth and that only a prophet could do as you have done. I am your follower now. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to him, you cannot follow me right now. He said, you can become Muslim. But you cannot join me right now, he said, when you hear that I have declared myself openly, <coughs> then you can come and follow me. I mean, the Prophet وسلم, he doesn't mean to tell a man, don't become Muslim now, but it's, it's perilous times. It's perilous times. 
If you become Muslim now, then you will be suffering some persecution. I don't want that for you. Keep your Islam quietly. When you hear, I have gained victory, the upper hand, then come and join me. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala they were traveling in the desert at the peak of the summer. So the place was, I mean the place was very hot. Ibn Isaac he says, then the guy took them down the valley to Kuba, uh, to the tribe of Banu Amr ibn Auf, and it was Monday the 12th of Rabi al-Awwal. And the heat was extreme. The sun, it was, I mean, it was also at its zenith. So it was very, very hot. So it was in the middle of the summer and it was very hot when the Prophet Sallallahu Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala made the hijrah. It wasn't, you know, winter time when it was cool. The Ansar of Medina, they will go out of Medina every day in the morning in anticipation of meeting the Prophet ﷺ and greeting him. But when the heat became too extreme, they would go back inside. So one day, they went out early in the morning waiting for the Prophet ﷺ, and when they did not show up, they went back inside. And there was this Jew who was climbing one of the high buildings. And he saw Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala approaching from a distance and they were dressed in white. They were dressed in white. Now, I mean, how were they dressed in white? New white clothing. It's because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala, they met up with Zubair ibn Awam, who was coming back from a business trip to, uh, to Syria and he had, bought some, he had bought some new clothing with him. So he gave the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala gifts. And these are the clothes that they were wearing on. New white clothing to enter Medina. So this Jew, he saw the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala and approaching from a distance. And he called out to the top of his voice, O oh, Arabs, here is your man, he has arrived. So the Ansar, they rushed towards their weapons. Now listen carefully to what they did. They rushed towards their weapons and they marched out to meet the Prophet wasallam. Now you might wonder, how come they took their weapons with them? I mean, or even, you know, putting on your weapons. How come they did that? Why come they didn't, why, why, why they didn't rush, just rush out, you know, to meet them? The reason could be that <clears throat> this was the tradition amongst the people of the Ansar. That when you meet someone or you greet them, you go out carrying your weapons. Now you don't see people doing that now. I mean, if some neighbor comes to your home or someone comes to greet you, you don't go out with a cutlass in your hand. <laughs> I mean, people will, you know, think differently. You know, you don't go out with a knife or a dagger or a club or a baseball bat or something like that in your hand, you know. But this was the tradition amongst these people, probably. So, I mean, in some, some tribal societies, you know, probably it's, it's like that. And then they will meet the important guests like that. They will take their weapons with them and they will greet their guests. Probably the other reason was that the pledge of allegiance the Ansar gave to the Prophet ﷺ was an allegiance of protection. Remember when Al Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib in the second pledge of Al Aqaba and the night when they came to make the Hajj. We had spoke about that before, you know, Hajj. And al Abbas said, do you think you can protect Muhammad? I mean, we are protecting him. If you think that you are not up for that, then leave him right here. We, we, we are doing a very good job at it. And the spokesperson from amongst the Ansar, they said, listen, 
We are warriors, sons of warriors, and we value our horses more than our sons. We value our horses more than our sons. We are warriors. I mean, the house and the Khazraj were always at it, fighting one another. An age-old warrior were fighting, so they were skilled fighters. So probably, they meant business. They took a pledge of protection to protect Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So they took up their weapons in order to meet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in order to keep with their pledge that they were offering him. So they were carrying their weapons with them to show him that here we are, ready and prepared to serve and protect you. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala arrived and the people started greeting and meeting them. Now when they arrived on the outskirts of Medina, which is Cuba, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he stayed there in Cuba for 14 days. And that is when uh, that is when he built the masjid in Cuba and it is the first masjid in Islam. And people who go for the Hajj or they go for Umrah it's it's must it's a must that you go to Masjid Kuba and you perform you know two rakats of Nafil Salah, you know. It's a very beautiful masjid. It's a very very beautiful masjid. So the masjid is a very special. It's a, this masjid is very special. If you make wudu at your home, and you go to Masjid Kuba, and you pray two rakat of Salah. It counts as though you have made Umrah. And that is the virtues of performing uh, two rakat of Salah. You make wudu and you go to Masjid Kuba and you perform two rakat of Nafil Salah. You get the reward, you get the reward as though you have performed an Umrah. So there is a very special virtue in performing Salah at Masjid Kuba. The Prophet Sallallahu he stayed at the house called the House of Bachelors. Because all of the men in there were bachelors. And that is the house of Sa'ad ibn Haythama. The Prophet Sallallahu he stayed in that house because all of these guests were coming in and out of the house. So he didn't want to stay with someone who had a family because it would have become too burdensome on them. He has his wife and he has his children and he has his house that is family oriented and here you have people coming in and always in and out and in and out. So he didn't want to burden anyone. So the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he sent messengers to Medina asking them permission to come in. So they sent a large delegation and they came and met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they said to him, Come in, you are safe and you will be obeyed. You are safe and you will be obeyed. So the Prophet ﷺ is not coming to Medina as a guest. He's not coming as just a guest. He's coming to lead the people of Medina. And they came and told him, you will be obeyed. Allah Rabbil Azza, he says in Quran, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا لِيُطَاعَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ He says that every prophet, every messenger that we have sent, we have sent them to be obeyed. So obedience to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is compulsory on every individual. I mean, you hear some people today saying that, you know, um, when you tell people things, they ask you a question, and this was a trend. I don't know if it's still the trend going around. Well, what is that in Quran? So, well, no, you know, that's the sunnah of the prophet. Oh, well, 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 you know, no, no. Uh, uh, no, if that's sunnah, well, you know. Is that Quran? I want to know if that's Quran. I, I wonder if you were to recite some verses of Quran and tell them, well, this is Quran, if they will follow it. Will they follow it? So this is the attitude today that some Muslims have. Any Muslim who says, or any person who claims to be a Muslim and he says that, I, I will only follow what Quran says and what Muhammad says that, you know, I, I, I'm sorry. That he is not Muslim. 
Allah says, وَمَا أَرُسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا لِيُطَعَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Every messenger, every prophet that we have sent, we send them to be obeyed. You have to follow him. Without any equivocations whatsoever, you must follow the Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You must follow him. So the people should follow the, messenger, the messengers of Allah. Now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he goes into Medina. I mean that was an amazing day. It was an amazing day. Imagine going into Makkah for the very first time. And you raise your head and you see al Kaaba. How do you feel? Knowing that the messenger of Allah sat here. And he made tawaf. And people who went, they know the feeling. It's something you can never, ever forget. And no pictures that you take with your cameras, it can tell a better story than the individual themselves. Imagine walking into Masjid Nabawi for the very first time. I mean, can you imagine being there and thinking that once the Messenger of Allah sat here, once he was there and he walked here, and he was there, and, and his house was there. And, I mean, he was right there. Revelation came here. I am in the land where Quran was revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I am sitting in a place where he probably sat. I am sitting at a place where he probably sat and revelation came to him. Can you imagine that? So the day he ended, I mean, that's an amazing thing. Some people, they cannot help themselves but just cry. I mean, that's, that, that, that cry is not tears of sadness. It's tears of joy. My feet is hurting very badly and that long walk I had to walk. So you are crying because your feet pain? No, that, that's tears of joy and happiness that I'm finally here. I'm happy to be here. <coughs> so there was this huge celebration people they came out in their numbers to greet him <coughs> the man whom they were looking for for days <coughs> he has finally arrived the Abyssinians they came out dancing on the streets now this is not an excuse for people to go around in nightclubs and pubs and, and party and dance and say, well, the Abyssinian girls were dancing on the streets of Medina when the Prophet ﷺ came in. This is not an excuse. I mean, this was the early stage of Islam and this was probably the people's custom of greeting them. Beating tambourines and beating the duff and singing songs and, you know, moving around on the streets and happiness. Don't use this as an excuse because people use this as an excuse today. Every little thing. I mean, people would not use the good things as an excuse to practice it, but they would look for things that are vague. And they would say, oh, and the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did that? Well, I'm doing that. That's a sunnah. Probably he did that once in his whole life. Once he did that. And he never did it again. And you mean to say, out of all the sunnah, this is the best you can do? Out of everything, thousands of practices. I mean, Imam Bukhari has, if we take off the repetitive hadith, about 4,300 narrations. Sahih al-Bukhari, besides the repetitive ones. Sahih Muslims are around the same number. So many books, thousands upon thousands of sunnah. And out of everything, you choose one. One out of everything? I mean, you're amazing. And say, well, I'm practicing the sunnah. Well, how about you practice this, brother? No, 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 no. I'm trying to revive this one. It's a dead one. Inshallah, we'll continue next week and continue reminding people that the class has started back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. وهي الدلائل أخلاقه 